And for me, it is a great delight to, um, to welcome all of you to this, it's not a conference, it's a workshop. From the um, 8th of May to the 14th of May, we're marking Mental Health Awareness Week. Five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago, ten years ago, mental illness or mental health issues were words and topics you dreaded to start to talk with anyone. It was something that was kept under lead. Don't mention it. So if you have an issue, if you're a psychiatrist, don't tell anyone. Your sister, your brother would let you say, don't let your cousins, don't let our cousins know that you have an issue. We we're all forced to keep quiet because of the very high stigma we have in our community about mental health issues. So you have a child, you have a brother with schizophrenia, and it's like, don't tell anyone. Because they would all think everybody in the family is mad. Let's keep quiet. And that stigma has pervaded. And unfortunately for the ethnic minority community, the stigma is higher. Because we have issues, we don't talk. And when we talk, sometimes we talk about the wrong things. And the right things we're supposed to be talking about, we miss out. So we've missed out massively on a lot of areas that we should have benefited from. Yes around conversations about mental health issues in the community. The longer we keep quiet, the more difficult it is for us to access services. The more difficult it is for commissioners of services to have a bespoke, if I can use the word, to have services that would meet our needs. The ethnocentricities around where I come from. My cultural practices are different. But when they don't know, the same pill will be prescribed for everyone. For as long as we keep quiet, people would not know. So we broke the barrier 2015, and we've been doing that. Going to community events, creating our own seminars, because who didn't want me to come and talk? I would contact people, it's, you know, I would like to raise my bill of awareness, and like, no. Faith communities shut the door. They didn't want us to talk about it, because they felt that it's prayers. You use prayers to deal with it. Both Muslim, both Christian, they just said that, no, these are things you don't talk about. So we said, you know what, if you don't allow us, we will start, I will start to invite members of the community. We'll invite the politicians so that they will hear from people in the community. We'll invite commissioners as well so that they would know that these are issues that people are no longer getting too scared to talk about. And that is what this is all about today. We welcome the Mayor of Bright. Thank you very much. We worship the Mayor of Bright. We welcome him. Thank you for, for coming. Thank you. So I'm going to hand you, if you give me this microphone, to be honest with you, I'm going to be talking for the next 20 minutes. So I'm going to hand you back to, to Janet. Janet, you need to be conscious of time. And even me, you know, you need to tell me to get on the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Lade. Let's give her another round of applause. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so let's get the day going on surviving or thriving. We'd like to uh, welcome a Dr. Adebayo. Um, who will be speaking on bipolar disorder and diagnosis. He's a consultant, psychiatrist, and uh, working for Oxley. Okay, so welcome. Let's give him a round of applause. One five minutes. <laughs> One five minutes. Well, my name is Femi, uh, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm here with my wife, Elizabeth. There she is, um, Ladi, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I am honored um, and I really am grateful for the work you're doing because there's a real big problem with mental health in terms of awareness. And um, thank you very much. Um, 15 minutes, good luck. Okay, there we go. <laughs> mental health awareness is a big problem. This, it's easy for, if I start talking too fast, please slow me down, I can get going. Um, it's, it's very easy for phrases like mental health awareness to become words we just throw around loosely. It becomes another phrase. But it really defines a massive problem. I remember years ago, I was talking to, I was talking to a young lady in my outpatient clinic. I can't remember exactly what we're talking about. She said to me, she said, um, I probably wouldn't be able to. She sees herself as not normal. <clears throat> you know, I, I, 
I, I, I, I, she brought me close to tears. I said, but why do you say you're not normal? I've got mental health. I said, what's not normal about that? I said, the majority of every of people around you have got one thing or the other. Hypertension, diabetes, epilepsy. I said, welcome to normality. That's the truth. He said, well, I take tablets. I said, so do I. I said, I've got blood pressure problems. I've got diabetes problems. I'm popping tablets. But I never say to myself, I'm not normal. Do you? Well, no, you don't. Why mental health? And it's stigma. It's lack of awareness. Mental health is a physical disorder. Like diabetes. Like epilepsy. It's no different. But it expresses itself in, the, in mental health symptoms. That's the only difference. The organ involved is the brain. You have diabetes, it's your pancreas, right there. That's where the problem is. And if you have depression, it's there. The brain is a physical organ. Hello. It is. It's, the mental health problem is no different from diabetes or hypertension. And that needs to go up there. Maybe a day will come we'll teach the word mental health. Because it sounds like something different. Something spooky. But I don't have much time. I can go on and on about my frustrations with that level of awareness. Um, I meet a few people and I see. We, we used to have a name, Ebony. Elizabeth, where's where she gone to? <laughs> yeah, we'll see that for ages. <laughs> Maybe we didn't pick her the last one. Right? Yeah. But the Ebony used to come around and bring her little you know, as usual stuff. The one day, for the first time after many years, her husband came along. And he came and uh, his wife introduced, oh, Hermie, he's a psychiatrist. I don't lie. He ran away. He ran away. So not only is it bad to have mental health, it's bad to be a psychiatrist. You know, <laughs> it's problems both ways. You know. Anyway, bipolar. Bipolar is a central nervous system disease. It's the brain. That's where the problem lies. Um, the brain is a very complex organ. It's, it, it works chemically, it works electrically, and it has a physical structure. And when you have any a problem, a specific problem of the brain, it, it can manifest in what we call the bipolar disorder. Bipolar used to be called manic depressive. You may have heard that term, which I think is very descriptive. Um, and it's because it describes a disorder where you have two abnormalities. One in which the brain is shut down. That's the depression part of it. Depression is not sadness. Many people who suffer from depression um, really get a lot of problems with family members who think that you're sad. They think, oh, I've been there, I've been sad. You know, put your socks up. Yes. Depression is not sadness. How can I compare? If you play a footballer and you're playing football and you have a slight spring in your ankle, that's sadness. Then you keep on playing. 20 minutes later, you fracture the bones in your legs. And the bones are sticking out, saying hello. That's depression. With a the, with the slight sprain, you might just about get on, pull your socks off. But you've got bones sticking out, it's over. Depression is not, I, I tell all my medical students, it's not, the word depression is, is a misnomer. Because people think of it only as a mood disorder. The mood is only one aspect. It's a brain depression. It depresses several parts of your brain. Concentration. Memory. The number of patients, middle-aged patients, referred to me by the GP, and the GP said, I think this man is suffering from early onset dementia. He can't remember where he put his keys, he can't remember the number of his car, uh, you know, he can't remember the names of his children. That's a bit extreme. And I say to him, and it's depression. The central nervous system is shut down. It shuts down memory, shuts down concentration, shuts down sleep, shuts down appetite, shuts down your gut. 
There's a long nerve that travels from your brain, very, very naughty nerve, travels to your heart and all the way to your gut, the vagus nerve. Shut everything down. The people who are depressed can't poo for days. So it's not just about mood. In fact, in many countries, people do not recognize the mood component of depression. They come and say, oh, doctor, I've got aches and pains. Because the physical weakness in depression is like the most severe flu you've ever had. The most severe. And there's no putting your socks on. You need you that, that needs treatment. Depression is pretty well known. But the other aspect for bipolar, not only do you have depression, but you have the opposite, where the central nervous system becomes fired up. Um, my worshipful bear, we had somebody who was really fired up with mania. You'd love him on your team. You'd have surplus energy. I spoke to this um, IT engineer. His work time is 9 o'clock to 5. He gets to work at 3.30 in the morning. His brain is so fired up, he doesn't need to sleep. He doesn't need to sleep. He goes to bed about 11. By 12.30, he's up. Whoa, ready and ready to go. Where's everybody? Hope we tied you here, the wife or the husband. You know, hoovering, painting, cleaning, tons of energy. Really fired up. And again, it's not just the mood that's fired up. Physical energy is fired up. You feel superhuman. And you're just on the go all the time. Now, whether it's depression or what we call mania, they can happen independently or they can happen together. We call it a mixed episode. Depression can get from mild, can get worse to moderate, you get out of bed, you just haven't got the energy to do so. Um, if you ask a very depressed person a question and say, How are you? you go, He's turning over slowly. I beg you, don't ask him a second question. He'll have to add it to the rank of things he has to do. He's turning over slowly. And when it gets very severe, he can get to the point where, I don't understand this, but whenever mood problems get to the extreme, the brain loses the ability to know what's real. That's what we call psychosis. What's real? So, get to the point where she starts, he or she starts to believe I'm the worst person in the world. I, I must be dead inside me. And all kinds of false beliefs and delusions set in. But same thing with, with the other end of, of bipolar. You get very, very high, and then you get to an extreme. I'm God. I've been told that. I'm an archangel. It's difficult to understand, but if you were in that person's head, you would believe the same. The degree of energy, the degree of power is amazing. So bipolar is a disorder that starts in young people, often about the age of 15. Women often start with depression, classically. Now in medicine, nothing is cut into rock. It can change. Women start with depression. And then the highs begin to come later. Let me say one thing about the highs. What do you think is the commonest mood when you're high? How, what's your mood? How do you, what do you feel? What do you think a person feels in bipolar when they're high? What do you think or what have you heard is the commonest mood? Happy? Happy? Excited? Excited? Elated. Elated? Fearless. Fearless. Fearless, yeah. There's still one that's even more common. Euphoric, <laughs> still, that's still number two. I, I haven't got the time to keep on enjoying this game. So I, I'll jump straight to it. Rage! Rage! Irritability. You wake up in the morning and you're already growling. <sighs> Nobody has said anything to you. Then you imagine that imagine that's, that's, a, that's, that's your husband by your side there. You wake up, think about one look and go, <sighs> he's gone, what do I say? What did I do? Did you have a bad dream? It's three days, four days, five days, marriage is end, friendship is end. Not to mention your sex drive. When that energy gets very high, your sex drive can go through the roof. I'll speed up, it's a bit too much, 
might just give an, an, an idea of that because it's a big problem. There was a lady who was married. Um, she had two or three children, I can't remember. We married about 10 years. Very nice lady. The GP had always known that she had depression. Remember what I said before, depression in women starts as the first sign of bipolar. One day the husband goes to work, gets a telephone call from a good neighbor. Your wife has just been to virtually every house on the street, and if there's a man in there, she's had sex with him. So we had to take her into hospital, get her treated, and on discharge, we had to find a new house for her, for the family. But that's the kind of sexual energies that can be associated with um, uh, with being high. In women, that's the depression, mania comes later. I had a patient, she was 50 years old, and she said, Dr. Devoy, I'm going to sue my GP. I said, why? He said, he never diagnosed me bipolar. I said, yes, because all these years, you were just mildly happy. It wasn't severe. When bipolar, when you're high and it's not severe, you work very hard. I get to the office at three, I do my work, I do all your colleagues' work, and I'm there at 10 o'clock at night, and I'm not tired, and I didn't drink coffee, I'm not okay. Good member of staff. You don't go to the gym when you feel that way. It's when it gets bad, that's when you get to find out. Men, it's the other way around. Men just start with mania. Remember Stephen Fry, the, uh, the, the, the what wonderful man, his story. In his late teens, before he was a, a righteous young man, he was a mania. Men turn up with mania. And then, as the years go along, depression kicks in. Whether it be mania or depression, as you get older, the episodes get longer and they get more severe. Untreated, the person begins to lose function. Ability to think clearly, confused thinking, self care. Who's that? Who's that? Anybody talking to me? <laughs> we haven't got time to talk about psychosis or voices. So that's the natural cause of treatment. The treatment for bipolar, a good number of treatments available. There are several medications called mood stabilizers. Interestingly enough, a good number of them are anti convulsant drug. With epilepsy, you have electrical waves going up and down. In bipolar, you have the mood going up and down. So you have uh, drugs like valproate, you have drugs like carbamazepine. I won't bother with all these long names. I never used to get them right for years. We have lithium. Let me talk a, bit, a little bit more about that later. I know that is a keen on me to mention that. Lithium, valproate, and carbamazepine are very dangerous if you in a childbearing age as a woman. Mm -hmm. Lithium can destroy the right side of the baby's heart. You get, oh, you just one in a thousand. What betide you if you're that one? That one? Yeah. What betide you? I don't, I don't believe numbers. If I was a woman, I'm not touching lithium unless I really have to. Yeah, if I'm 60, that's different. Bath break will destroy the baby's brain and spinal cord. So we'll cover myself here. Yeah, one minute more. So, so those are some of the treatments. You have a land, you have antipsychotics. Please don't be put off by the word antipsychotics. Aspirin is used for blood thinning, pain, arthritis. You know, it has so many uses. And many antipsychotics are really multiple drugs. They're antidepressants, they're mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, anti-anxiety, sleep tablets. They are very, very, very good um, when used properly. The right medication depends on the right patient. You have to match the medication to the patient. You can have psychological treatment to support that part of the, um, of the treatment. Psychological treatment is very, very important. Um, there's some more extreme treatments I won't bother now because I've run out of time. And I'm hoping that when we have the question and answers time, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to give answers if I know the answers. Thank you very much. So, wow, that's a wealth of information that we've got there. So let's just uh, give Dr. Adebayo another round of applause. Thank you very much. We love the things that I didn't know. I mean, I mean, I know we've got to stick to time, but I just, uh, just so something that I just kind of uh, it triggered the thought in me, um, and it just reminded me of, of how sometimes we are 
we are walking this walk every day and we're, we feel some of these, the same symptoms that he's explained to us today and we are fearful of, it, of expressing them, telling anybody, sharing them. And a lot of us are fearful um, of actually being a, um, taking medication. That's another key thing, you know, um, a lot of us don't want to be taking medication to manage it or we try to manage ourselves. I think this is a really good, good um, forum to kind of tap into um, natural therapies, different coping strategies with all the, um, the, the professionals that we have today. Um, so, we have the next person coming up, and I'm going to say this, this person, thank them very much for coming today, because it's, I myself suffer from anxiety and a lot of depression, and it's, sometimes it's very hard to share with people, and for anybody to understand how you feel, you know, you're in an office and you're feeling kind of low today, and they just think you're moody. You know, and or you're talking to somebody, you just want somebody to listen to you, but they may think you're just having a moan or whatever. So sometimes it's very, very difficult, you know. So I would like to give you all, I'd like you all to give this person a nice warm welcome because he's here to share his experience with bipolar. Um, his name is Eche Ebonu. Did I, did I pronounce that right? Yeah. I did? Yeah. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. So yes, my story, and it began in 2015, and what I find interesting is that they, they mention that it normally happens in that kind of teenage, 15 years old, but mine was about 10 years later, my experience of mania. Okay. Next slide. So yeah, so in 2015, Spent 25 years on the probably close to the full introvert end. So that's how I perceive life. And so working in a fantastic job at this particular time and I uh, started to feel these changes. I don't know why I felt the way I did, but I was enjoying it. Thought that I was coming out of my show. Feeling more spiritual, I guess, more connected with, with the world, things seem more beautiful. Just the sun, the trees, everything seemed fantastic. And I, I realized that there's less need for things like sleep. And this is, this is fantastic. I'm finally coming out of my shell, was the way that I interpreted it. And it's interesting because in that same summer, I went to my GP and I was taking antidepressants for what I believed was anxiety. So there was almost a self-diagnosis, but then what compounded things was the fact that I was using um, a lot of cannabis as well. So it was a quite an interesting cocktail that I had put together. But some of the things that happened was I just saw my confidence went sky high. Talking became easy. It's quite extroverted, I had all these grand schemes and ideas. Some of the things we see here, spending spree, maxed out all different types of credit cards, loans, and I'm still paying the repercussions for that. <laughs> Volume of talking and the rapidness of my speech. Like I would, if I caught you, I would speak for like two, three hours, and I wouldn't realize until someone said it, it's bedtime. You've been talking for three hours. And I remember being in the museum and one of my friends was like, shh, I was so excited. It was like I was a child, but in, in my grown body and I still had my intelligence, creativity, poor judgment. I remember being swindled for a few hundred pounds on one of the new credit cards that I bought. One of these guys you find in the shopping center He's like, do you want this Galaxy phone? I was like, why yes? This is fantastic, this is... He's made my day. Went to the guy's car. Like I had so much trust, I was so vulnerable. Had my little suitcase. Left my suitcase, saw the Galaxy and the, and the iPad. I'm like, yeah, let's go to the cash point. <laughs> Maxed out the card. Had the, what I believe to be the tablet and I got home. Opened it, and there's newspapers. <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, he's 
swindled me. But I was like, okay, that well done kind of thing. Also, something else that happened that I thought I was the next kind of Bill Gates big businessman. Like when you have these ideas, when you're that confident, you can't see any failure. So I had my little suitcase, feeling like an entrepreneur, and I was going to trade in some items at the shopping center. And I decided, you know what, let me do an experiment. Um, so I had some goods inside, it opened up in Dalston, I'm from Hackney, and I'm like, okay, who wants this smartwatch? Gave the smartwatch away, had a laptop there as well, just giving out all different kinds of electronics. And the phrase that I would say in order to get that was, am I crazy? So if the person said no, I'm like, yeah, take the watch. So it was, a, it was an interesting thing, interesting way that I was seeing life. What else did we have? So yeah, and then there's the family tension. Of course, they don't know what's happening. I'm feeling super human. I'm like, I'm a superhero. My brother's listing out symptoms. He said, happy, heightened senses, no need for sleep. I'm like, you're describing an X-Man. Like, this is fantastic. I'm not crazy. Like, you are the ones that are crazy. So I, I was enjoying what I was going through. And I had this fascination with the, the Matrix. Like the way I visualized the world was different, and this is where it gets kind of tricky because they this is what they say to be a component of the psychosis. Because the way I was seeing things, the way I was seeing life, my, my perception had changed, even though I didn't have the, the more severe hallucination hearing voices. I can get the next slide, please. And so, in the midst of all of this, I had an encounter. After that same family tension, it led to section 136. This is a 72 hour order that they can use if they believe that you could be a threat to yourself or others. So in this 72 hour period, they can hold this assessment. And so after an episode of irritability, frustration, I kind of left the house with all types of goods, like I, was, I had bought a vinyl player and I was carrying the vinyl player and some clothes and it was just chaos. Went to four different hotels and after interactions with the police and everything, they took me in to Eden Hospital or something, something in that kind of vicinity. And there was a consultant who wanted to get me sectioned, but then that was overruled by two and so I guess the way I was thinking, my resistance to engage with the system was increasing because of that experience. And so that was what I was all about. I was studying the human rights act. I'm like, okay, so under what circumstance can they take me in? Because I, what I felt was that the early, inter early intervention mechanism was quite flawed in my case because it seemed they just wanted to get me inside. And so. I'm thinking, okay, how, how can I keep myself free? So this is what they, they even told me, because I lost some of my memory in that moment, but my mom said that they would come with the ambulance and the police van and try to take me in. But I'd always bring up that human rights act and, and they would have to go home kind of thing. So if we can get the next slide. So what ultimately happened then was I think maybe five days after that section 136 discharge, Family tension is there, and there's an altercation with me and my brother and my friends, and I end up smashing the radiator in my bedroom, and so that's now leaking water, and so the room is in a mess, and the police are called, and this time, based on their observation or whatever evidence they have, now the section two happens. But instead of being taken to the police station, I mean, to the hospital, taken to a police station because they're waiting for a bed to become available. So that's meant to be one of the places of safety. But it was actually the worst place that they could have taken me to because in that state of mind, that kind of paranoia, like, why did you put me here? I haven't hurt anybody. Only thing I've hurt was the radiator. Like, it doesn't warrant this level of treatment. So I'm feeling like a criminal in my own community. 
all I wanted to do was help out, giving away things and purging and trying to help the community, the young people. But yeah, I find myself in the hands of five, six officers being held down. Like they're trying to provoke a response from me. I'm like, is this how they treat everybody? Or is there a level of discretion? Um, so yeah, that was probably the most vivid and traumatic part of that particular episode. If you can get the next slide. And so they, they took me to Brett Ward in Homerton Hospital. And this document is, this is, as it says, it's my mental health on admission. So you can kind of see where I was at. And I, I, I love to visit this document because there's some interesting things. So as you see, speech fast, difficult to interrupt. Mood and effects, excellent. So this is after the police station. So I'm just happy to be out. But there's still some lability, crying about how much I love my mom. Thoughts rapid, tangentiality, which I still have. I just kind of bounce around from topics to topics. Um, preoccupied with helping others by giving away his belongings, starting projects, etc. Also how he has changed over the last few weeks, very much for the better. No frankly delusional content, some religious themes, which I thought was also interesting because this mental health and religion, it's hard to separate the two at times. Cognition grossly intact, so, but I had low insight according to them, because you don't perceive it, the, the thoughts that you have seen so real and fundamental, it's that blurring of the lines of what reality seems to be. And it makes that And so what happened was, I'm in Brett Ward, feeling quite bored, I see a lot of highly drugged up people, I'm like, okay, I don't want that to happen to me. Um, and after the first two days, there's a broken guitar, some books and some DVDs, channel one to five, I'm like, this is kind of long, I'm fine, I'm going home. And so I broke out of there, don't know how, walked home, thought that this would be it, let's move on with life. But the police came, long story short, Taser was involved, took me back to the hospital, spent three weeks inside Brett or Bevan Ward, which is the intensive care unit. And I didn't really talk to any kind of psychologist or someone to, about what I was going through, which I thought to be interesting. And it was just the medication, some of the meds they mentioned, haloperidol, antipsychotics, um, sodium valproate. Any the next slide, please. And next one as well. So yeah, three weeks in there, came out of a diagnosis, bipolar affective disorder with psychotic features. And so it was coming out of that, is now the, the rock bottom phase, going from the high to ground zero. Can barely get out of bed. My day consists of wake up, eat medication, cycle that three times, go to bed at nine o'clock. And but it took a lot of family support to really pick myself out of that on and off the medication, bouncing back and forth between denial, acceptance. Had some therapy at a certain period, which was, it was good to express myself, but what I found to be even more helpful was the small conversations with my mom, just kind of finding out about her story, just kind of raised me up as well. Um, also, getting back into the gym, and so, it was actually after a depressive, kind of mildly suicidal um, episode of depression in April of last, or July of last year, that I decided to um, come off the medication and try a different approach to kind of find myself again. Because you really lose yourself. You're like, okay, where, where does the depression begin? Where does the mania begin? Who am I? Am I an introvert? Am I an extrovert? Am I in the middle? So I kind of, I was just confused. And so I've been trying different methods different methods of healing, um, going to the gym, as I said, looking at my diet, what I consume, the people that I'm around, and next time, and I guess what I've tried to do is to turn this experience into a way to kind of 
raise awareness, holding certain events in Hackney, especially as a young black man. And yeah, there's always that statistic that gets to me, 17 times more likely to be diagnosed with a psychotic disorder. And so I'm now kind of among those statistics that I was researching. So I, f I found cathartic ways of expression, I use poetry, write some articles and also events like this. I've done some of my own workshops as well around Hackney uh, as well. So it's raising awareness. I also did mental health first aid training, finished off a diploma in education and training, working on a book as well, which will help to also spread that message. Maybe someone can find something and take away from that. But it's, it's basically a process of rebuilding building from those experiences and it's, say, it's a struggle. Like, the battle always continues. I thought that I had crossed the threshold and that, okay, I've put it behind me, but then that, then you go on that kind of downward spiral again. And I'm trying to find different ways of, of managing. Um, and I guess it's, I'm moving closer to a point of realization and with hindsight, I'm better able to understand what happened to me and I think that brings this presentation to a close. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. That was so informative and it was real. Yeah. And it was just, it was on ground, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I guess some of you can feel either some of the things that you've experienced or you've seen experience or seen around you, with your colleagues, your friends. You know, and it is, it's a difficult thing, you know. Um, I think another trigger for me, so I used to teach uh, Keep Fit, and I had a lady that I trained, and the training wasn't to keep fit, as in physically fit, it was mentally fit. Um, it was a mature woman, and uh, she also suffered from bipolar, but she also had diabetes and a few other things. And do you know, you touched on the fitness aspect of things, going out, doing a bit of training, being outside, you know, instead of being cooked up indoors. And just the walks that we used to do every, twice a week helped her immensely. She smiled a lot and she talked through a lot of her experiences. The shopping, you know, she talked about the shopping. Um, doctor that you talked about before, the sexual experiences and how well her husband coped with her, you know. Um, thank you, thank you again. So, we have Teresa Palmieri. Yes, okay, hi, welcome. And uh, you are senior therapist in Brent? Yes. Okay, so welcome, thank you very much. Thank you everybody. Um, so my name is Theresa Lapamiri, I'm one of the senior cognitive behavioural therapists in the Brent IAP service. I'm not sure you're aware of that we are a primary care service in the NHS and we offer support to everyone who's experienced symptoms of common mental health difficulties, including depression and anxiety. Um, first of all, I have to say what a privilege to be here. When I first met Lale a few months ago, I couldn't believe her passion and we said we need to work together and make sure that we try to make everyone aware of what a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, as well as people that actually have brothers and husbands, wives that care for them and that they have to actually to cope with, with that. Um, so the idea is just to make you all aware of what we do and just to, to really let you know that there is, a, there is support out there. Uh, there are lots of different things, as Edge was saying, you know, just uh, exercising, making sure that you talk and you have the support family and friends. But also, there is professional support and it is easily accessible. Um, and you can access it without going to your GP if you don't feel like that. Just, just giving us a call and then we'll have a chat. And so it's there and then you, you know, I'd like to hope that after these you can feel comfortable giving us a call and say, oh, I want to talk to someone, I want someone to, you know, to listen to me. Um, so, uh, you know, I was asked to just give you a general overview of uh, low mood and depression, stress, anxiety, which are symptoms that we experience. Uh, I think all of us experience those symptoms and uh, what CBT is, which is the, one of the most um, uh, used type of therapy in treating depression and anxiety in, in the NHS. Um, and then if we've got time, hopefully just give you some tips around mental well-being, what to do 
to, to stay healthy. Next one, please. Okay, so just to say that um, mental health issues are extremely common. Um, if you think about yourself traveling by train and you're in a carriage with other 10, 15 people, one in four will have experienced some form of um, low mood anxiety in their lifetime. So imagine how many of us. It's extremely common and lots of people, as you can see, they've suffered from uh, they have a diagnosis of um, either bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, and depression, anxiety. Next one, please. So, but I, I guess it's all the sensation, all the feelings that we experience of, you know, feeling down, feeling upset, feeling stressed and, and anxious. Those are actually um, are, are emotions that we all feel and that we don't have to feel good all the time. Those emotions are there for a reason, are there to protect us, are there to actually to, 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 to prompt us to perform well. It's just when they start becoming so severe and they start interfering with our day-to-day -day functioning, that's when it becomes a bit more problematic. Can you please go through? So we all experience a, a wide range of painful emotions. Um, but when they are very frequent, that's when we have to start thinking about how we can get some help. And that could, as I said, could vary from talking to a member of your family, a friend, or just going to the GP. So depression, some of the symptoms, as the doctor was saying, um, it's not just sadness. It kind of includes loads of different um, things. It just it affects your mood, the way you feel about yourself. It affects your thinking, the way you think. It becomes extremely negative. You think that you won't be able to do things. You think that you, you, you won't be able to cope. It affects your behaviours, what you do and what you don't do. You can't be bothered to do things. Your level of motivation goes down. Um, your body, the level of tiredness, exhaustion, you can't get out of bed. Um, and they, these symptoms will gradually start interfering with your life to the point that it will affect many different areas from relationships, your ability to perform your job, your ability to look after your children. Stress and anxiety, and they very often go together, very, very often. It's, um, by stress and anxiety, we, again, we do refer to a wide range of different symptoms, the way we feel in our body, uh, very fidgety, uh, quite panicky, our heart might start beating fast, sweaty, and then we feel tense, nervous, we can't stop worrying, and then kind of, uh, there are lots of different forms of anxiety, I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, but yeah, so C CBT, the Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, is basically the type of therapy that we do offer in lots of different formats. So it can go from one to one, or a group with other people, or it could be just over the telephone. Uh, people will, you know, one of us will give you a call every two weeks and then you will be doing things individually. The aim of this therapy is just to give you the tools and techniques so that you become your own therapist. I always say to the people I work with when we are in the room, I say there, always, there, are, there are two people in this room and there's one expert and that expert is you. Because you are the one who's experiencing these issues. I might have a bit of knowledge, I might actually guide you through, but at the end of the day, we are working together. So the idea is just to give you tools and techniques. And the idea of CBT is basically that, is that the way we feel, whatever emotions we experience is strongly determined by the way we think and the way we behave. Can we please go to the next slide? And just, yeah, click as I go through. So just to give you a quick example of how we see things. So there might be something that, 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 that triggers us to think in a very negative way. It could be an argument with our wife, it could be a, a problem with a colleague, it could be an upset, then our thoughts become more negative. And as a result, we start feeling uh, tired and the motivation goes down and we, we, we can't be bothered to do things. So we tend to withdraw, we don't want to go out, we don't want to mingle with people, we don't want to answer the phone. And as a result of that, we'll miss out opportunity to feel better. And then our mood will deteriorate further. And it will become a vicious circle, which is very difficult to get out of. And as the doctor was saying, it's not really about, you know, pull your socks up. It's, it's just you need some, some practical help. Um, and I guess that that's where we... We, we're here for, it's just to, to, to help, CBD will help you with depression, low mood, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't have um, time to go through all of them, but when we have the you know, time for, for questions and answers, I'm happy to answer all the questions about these different disorders. 
this is one service offers um, assessment of where you are and what might be helpful to you. If we're not the right people to help you, we'll, we'll recommend where you can get that help. Um, employment support to help you get back into employment and loads of signposting to lots of other organisations to help you um, go back into exercising, to help you uh, develop, um, to help you uh, access mindfulness uh, courses, a wide range of, of different resources, it's not just one-to-one -one therapy. And the idea is that you can access these immediately. I've, I've brought some, some forms here. If you, if you really want to know a bit more, if you want someone to listen to you and just have a chat with you, all you need to do is just complete a form, tick the box and we'll give you a call. And there's no pressure to do anything at all to, to access the service, just, just to be listened to. Um, if you have doubt, if you don't know whether the way you're feeling is normal, if you don't know how to, to, to better support someone who's experiencing um, you know, it's going through a difficult time. We, we, we often think about who's, on, who's, who's, who's going through a difficult time. What about us when we are trying to support them? How do we do it? What, what's the best thing to say to them? How, how am I going to help them feel better? Um, can we move to the next one, please? Yeah. So we also offer counselling, which is, again, a reflective approach to go to talk about issues in more depth. We do, next one please, we do offer perinatal support, so um, we understand that you know, being a new parent can be a very stressful time, so we tend to kind of offer support to mothers and fathers and we prioritise these cases just to be, to be um, so that people are um, uh, getting support more quickly. And next one please. Um, as I said, we do offer a lot of appointments in lots of different locations. We want to try to reduce the stigma attached to it. So we don't want to offer support only in GP surgery. So we try to offer support in lots of different centres, um, including religious places. We are based in mosques and churches. Um, and we, we want people to feel comfortable coming to us and having their support. And we offer support in lots of different languages. And uh, I'm not sure whether I've got time to go through, can we move to the next one? Do I have time to go through this, Lady? Yeah? Just quickly. Yeah, so the idea is just um, looking at simple, some simple things that you can do to stay mentally healthy. And this doesn't mean to be anything complicated. When people think about therapy, they think, oh my god, what are they going to be doing to me? No, it's just helping you get back into a healthy routine. Slowly and gradually. So it's like, I don't know, thinking, I've recently broke my ankle and the feelings of frustration and I wanted to get better immediately and then I realised this is not going to help me, I have to be patient. So that's what we do, we just to help you go through as if we are physiotherapists, but this time it's with your, with your mental well-being. So gradually, slowly going back into a healthy routine. So, now so we can skip this, I don't know what it's there. So, yes. Again, so just, just mental well-being, it's about really managing stress, low moods, sleeping well, enjoy life, and maintaining positive relationships. So a few, few tips to take away. If you, can you move to the next one, please. Yes. So this is a five a day. So one thing is be active. We talked about it quite a lot. So the importance of exercising. Um, I'm really hoping that the GPs will get into their habit of prescribing exercise. Um, it's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's brilliant because you know the, the, the benefits of exercising are amazing. Um, and actually they work as a as a natural exercise is a natural antidepressant. So if you can exercise it, this doesn't mean to go to the gym every day, but just going for a walk is amazing the, the benefits it can have on our mood. Connect with others. I do I, I'm always so Happy when someone comes to me and says, oh, I, was, I was out last night and this lady was telling me about her mum and that she was talking about it so openly and I felt so good. I said, Oh, we're getting there. People can feel comfortable talking about it. Um, taking notice and living the present, there was a lady asking me about mindfulness. Mindfulness is such a mindfulness course, which is about living in the present rather than being worried about the future or getting stuck in the past. There are lots of courses available for free. In, in Brent, and I'm happy to, to give you information and, and, um, and to tell you how to access those, those courses. Giving a volunteer, feeling that sense of achievement, that you're contributing to the community, that you're part of it, that you're helping others. 
Um, so just, just to keep these things in mind, and start making small changes. It doesn't matter how big the change is, as long as you get started. <coughs> Can we quickly go, I think I've gone through, yeah, connecting with others, and uh, yeah, next one, seeing friends and family, um, be active, going for a walk, uh, noticing that, eating a healthy diet, and um, trying to sleep well. It's, it's pretty rushed, but I'm happy to answer any, any questions. And if you want more information about how to access support, as I said, it's free, it's confidential, and it's very easy to access. Thank you. Thank you very much. So again, there we go. We've got a lot of information, lots of new information, services within Brent. So for all of you that live in Brent, uh, those of you that don't live in Brent and you don't have these services in your own area, come and speak to Therese. I'm sure she'll point you in the right direction. Um, and maybe they could do some work in, in your boroughs as well. Um, so let's just give them another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's say thank you very much to the Mayor and Council. Thank you very much. Okay, so the next speaker we have is Temi Tope. Did I pronounce that right? Yes. Okay. Um, from the BAME, B-A-M-E community. Talking about how do we respond. Let's give him a round of applause. Welcome him once again. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Just listening to some brilliant speakers talking about how to deal with the polar. Well, I think we need to take it from another perspective now, particularly from the community perspective. And I'm looking at it from the EME perspective. Well, I think it's important that we do this um, in the sense that there are two things we don't talk about in our community. We don't talk about mental illness and we don't talk about it. Because those two things are not the areas. Nobody wants to talk about them. In fact, they talk about other people. And when people ask questions, they say, I know somebody. They're actually talking about themselves. <laughs> so they say, I know somebody that has this issue, this mental issue. How do we deal with it? But actually, they're actually talking either about themselves or they're talking about people within their family. And I think one of the things we found out having been in this country for 20, 25 years, 23 years plus, now, I found that we've got lots of family members, friends that have had one crisis or the other, challenges, and they've you know, stuck it in. And that really causes a lot of challenge because there's nobody to turn to. Uh, if you organize a party in a community, you have everyone there. You will be with nursing for 10 years. If you organize events like this that looks into the issue of mental health or want to bring community leaders together to come up with an action plan, you don't see anybody. And the reason is because our priorities are mis uh, are misplaced. And it is now time, especially with what is going on in our community, that we look into this area. And that's the reason why I'm very grateful to Lide because of the work she's been doing uh, of recent. And we've also been looking into this area because we have a lot of people that are actually suffering from mental challenges and that needs help. Um, just like Dr. Femi rightly said, we need to redefine it. Maybe if we change the name, maybe if we change the way we looked at it, maybe people will be more receptive to it, maybe people will open up and talk about it, especially in our place of worship, which is one area where we have a lot of challenges. Uh, uh, people go for, you know, for deliverance. You know, sometimes the deliverance are no proper deliverance. I've, I've seen videos, and I know most of you have seen videos of people eating grass, you know, and saying that, that that's a form of deliverance. You know, you see people you know, putting together different kind of concussions, you know, to try and deal with this issue, which, you know, they should have dealt with in a different way. There's nothing wrong in meeting with, you know, uh, people within your religious um, environment where you're comfortable. Because actually, one of the ways to deal with uh, challenges is to be able to open up. So if you open up to you know, leaders within the religious community, then what we need is for them to actually have a st steps in which they deal with issues. So when you identify that somebody has mental issues, how do you take it forward in terms of 
you know, post it, you know, sending the person to the right, you know, uh, practitioners to guide them. So you give them the prayer, but you also help them. Because even, even in, in Christmas, because their state of mind, you know, it depends on where their state of mind is. If their state of mind is that everybody in that church um, is after them to kill them, then they're coming in with a knife or something else and causing havoc. And we don't want that. You know, and we've seen that in other countries, like in America, of expertise. It's not only in community engagement, but also in preventive terrorism. And one of the things we found out with lone wolves, you know, uh, that's people that go out, you know, to cause havoc, mainly diaspora people from the diaspora community, second and third migrants, you know, settled migrants in the UK, is that most of them have identity challenges. Mm -hmm. They have identity challenges. They're born here, they can't find work, or maybe they got a DHD when they were in school that was not diagnosed, um, and as a result, you know, they got into one or two trouble, and as a result, they got um, what you call a record, and because they've got a record, it's one thing to be BME and not be able to get a job, even if you've got a position. It's one thing to have a criminal record. And once you have a criminal record, you can't get a job. When you can't get a job, you mix with the right, wrong crowd. And then everybody in the community, especially because you've got some mental challenges now, <coughs> some people are your enemy. The police is your enemy. The state is your enemy. And when you look at the guy that committed the, um, the Westminster attack, what we found out from that story, I know many people don't like to talk about that kind of issue, is that this individual walked past a lot of people that were trying to talk to him, just like the um, Michael uh, Adebowale, who stood to talk to the woman that was trying to speak sense to him. He was not ready to kill that woman because he doesn't see that woman as an enemy. <coughs> what kind of state is, mental state is he? Where certain people are not his enemy, but certain people are his enemy. So when the police came, he rushed towards the police because he wants the police <coughs> to kill him. So you, we need to start having this discussion in our community to say, what is our children? What is the community going through? How do we identify people within our community? And how do we help them and not put stigma on them? That is where we need to get to in our community. We are going through a phase where we are able to talk about issue of money, where we are able to talk about people you know, about standing up and helping the community. But what we've not been able to talk about much is the issue of the mental health. How do we break it down? One of the things that we've been doing is engaging within ourselves in terms of the stockholder engagement, you know, engaging with government so government know we are here, so that government could include us. Because what we need more is uh, uh, an inclusive stakeholder engagement strategy where it's not just about calling the big names but inviting the little communities, the, you know, the nose organization, you know, the African Security Forum and talking to them and saying these are the challenges in the country, this is you know, the, rule, the, the way we feel we should deal with issues and then for us to cascade that information to our community because we know the people in our community, we know the family that they have each other as having challenges and if we know those individuals, we know how to speak to them to say, this is where you need to get that, that help. But as professionals, because one of the good things about the BME community is that we have, as individuals, we have a lot of expertise. You know, we have people like Dr. Fen, we have others who work in very good places that know the right people to engage with. What we now need is to draw that, have that collective approach to bringing everybody together and saying, this is how we need to do this in our community. Let's develop an action plan to deal with this issue. Let's have community champions. Let's have people that we could call up on. You know, people that people could call their numbers and say, this is the problem I'm going through in my family. And without them having that stigma, and without them having that fear, because the greatest fear is the fear of not being able to say what you're going to. But once you're able to say to somebody, and that's the reason why free numbers are good, that's why <laughs> communities, because you could call that number and say, I'm going through this. And they say, really? But that's not, a real, that's not a problem. We can do it this way. I think one of the ways that we in the community could break that is through our, our place of worship. Because place of worship is one area that we've not been able to penetrate. You know, we have, uh, and I'll give you a classic example, we have situations to do with immigration, for example, where people are so depressed now 
that their development are challenges because nobody has spoken to them to say, this is what you need to do. But sometimes, you know, it's important that we do this because the, as a Christian, I'm, I come from a Christian pastor, please forgive me. He said, wherever you step your feet into, it's a blessed place. <laughs> Thank you. You know, so that means that even when you are in Congo, you could be blessed. You don't need to stay in the UK. You don't need to live in one little room where you have a mansion at home. You have a mansion back home where you could live. You could do, you could do a lot of things based on the expertise you develop, you know, and develop yourself. You won't develop mental problems or mental challenges. You won't hear siren and jump under the bed or try to jump out of the window. You know, that's part of the mental state that people are going through. People are being detained. And when they go into the into detention centers, they feel I'm not a criminal. And immediately they, they think about the fact that they are not a criminal, they develop mental challenges because they believe that if I'm a, if I'm a criminal, I'm t I deserve being locked up. So the, that mental state could cope with it. But when you feel you're not a criminal and you're being locked up, you develop mental challenges. So people are being released from detention and they're walking like they're walking around like a dead person because they don't know where they're going, they don't know where they're coming from. So my appeal to our community today, because I can see a lot of community leaders, is that how could we come together and address this time bomb in our community? Is the unspoken word, is there any part in the room? We have a challenge, we need to look at it. We need to develop community champions to look at the issue of mental health. So now let's live here today and you know make up our mind that as a community collectively, we'll have community chapters, people that people could talk to and speak to. And I feel uh, I should leave it at this. I know there will be questions later. I will take it from there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for another big round of applause. You know, it's, it's really important that uh, we do use our experience and tap into any services or build new services. Um, the thing I was trying to remember when I was just talking is that even as professionals or people that have been through the experience, you, you tapped on um, thinking out of the box, right? So you don't have to be in this area to survive, you don't have to be in that area to survive. So as professionals, okay, we have a lot of knowledge and a lot of information in each of the fields that we work in. But come on, sometimes the information we're giving to a lot of the people out there is not wide enough. We're so creative if we want to, if we have a passion for football, we look at every football team and what they're wearing, what colours, if we draw a picture, we look at the different scene, we find different ways to do things, if we like buying clothes, we look at the various different designs. Let's use those skills to help our, our community and the people and the sufferers, you know, to help them be creative and how to survive that day, because it is possible. But how? You know, so let's, let's help each other. So on that note, we're going to take a 20 minute break, I believe. Um, a coffee break, 20 minutes, 15 minutes. I'm just coming on back. Um, are we all okay? Yeah. You know yes. what I said earlier, energy, are we all okay? Yes. 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 Oh, thank you, Dr. Adibaya. <laughs> I think you got the cue. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I'll do that again. Are we all okay? Yes. yes. Are we all okay? Yes. yes. Your emotions, a lot of the time, is expressed with our voices. <laughs> Communication is highly non-verbal and can be verbal as well. So I just wanted to make a point with that. And I was trying to take my time because we're trying to get the room for the lunch room. <laughs> <laughs> to get the room for the lunch room. So we have some little bits and pieces for you to, uh, for you to eat next door. It's not much, it's just something to eat or munch on while you're networking. A lot has been said today, and I do realize that um, the topic we're talking about is quite emotional. Um, I remember that we had a session about um, two months ago, and some people actually walked out. Walked out, not because um, they felt the information they were getting was not necessary, but because they could, they could relate with a lot of the symptoms. And I just want to say thank you very much, AJ. It's so bold of you. Thank you. He is a staff at today to learn to do this. He spoke expressly, not holding anything back, about what the experience of bipolar is. 
And unfortunately, the reason why we pick the theme for bipolar disorder is because it's one of the most undiagnosed. I'm not a clinician, but I work in the community. And I, I'm a graduate of um, doctor, I'm a graduate of the University of Google. <laughs> do we all know that university? Yes. University of Google. I'm a graduate, I'm actually doing my PhD at the moment. And it's one university where you never ever finish, you know? You need the information, just put it on. It's a really, lot of the information are suspect, but by the time you go through one, two, three, four, five sites, you seek through and you get the truth and you get the reality. The truth is bipolar disorder, those things that HAB said earlier, some of us may be able to identify with them. You know, the, the sudden swing from the high to the low and things you cannot explain, the sudden irritation that you just can't explain. A lot of people are walking around undiagnosed. And my theme and one of the passions that I push toward is for breast cancer, you'll be told these are the signs to look out for. Women will be encouraged, you know, check your breast every month, do this in a circular motion. For, um, for prostate cancer, men are told the signs and the things to look out for. For heart problem, you are encouraged the things to look out for. We're not talking about self-diagnosis, we're not encouraging self-diagnosis. However, there are signs that you can look out for, like all the signs that HIV said earlier. So if you know you're meeting one or two of them, still help, don't keep quiet. The reality is a lot of people are suffering in our communities. A lot of people are keeping quiet. We think they don't need to keep quiet about. We have a fantastic talking therapy that Teresa talked about earlier that we can tap into. And most local authorities actually have the scheme improving access to talking therapies, where a lot of people don't. I work in Brent here. The truth is Sandy will be any witness, and Grant is supposed to be here, who's another officer here, will be any witness. We have what we call an employee assistance program. Only about 25% of staff, staff tap into it. So you have all of this massive resource, and people aren't choosing them. Why? Because there's no awareness. And that's what we're doing today, to create and raise awareness. Let's talk about mental health issues. Let's talk about mental illness. Let's call it what it is. And stop psychedelizing it, you know, trying to make it good. It's mental illness, it's like any other illness. You call cancer, cancer. You call diabetes, diabetes, mental illness. Sometimes we try to cover it, and we say it's mental health. Mental health is a state of it that everybody has. But it could be tipped over and it becomes an illness. Just like we all have hearts. We all have pancreas. Your pancreas could start to malfunction and then the person develops diabetes or whatever condition. The heart can start to malfunction and the person develops high blood pressure or whatever it is. Mental illness is mental illness. Let's take the lead off and let's start talking. Thank you all so much. We have 20 minutes break or 15 minutes break. And I look, I'm so looking forward, you know what, this session, one of the things I look forward to is the open mic session, where we can ask questions and people can talk, okay? So don't go. And then we have a brilliant Dr. Shadia Oloji, who you need to listen to her talk. All of the speakers are fantastic. On Thursday, Sandy was here. Weren't you, Sandy? On Thursday, Sandy was here. We had a list of fantastic speakers. Teresa was here as well. People didn't want to go. I tried to squeeze in between two to four, just two hours. And the feedback we got was that we need to have this for three hours, we need to have this for four hours, we need to have this every quarter. So that means that there's an appetite. People want to know because people are suffering. It's not all doom and gloom. There's some food and the sun is shining. So please, it's, it's okay for you to take some pictures. Don't you just love Wembley? That's the reason why I travel one hour 45 minutes every day <laughs> to come here. <laughs> it's one hour 45 minutes to one hour 45 minutes back. But I love Brent. Thank you so much. Please give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. So the food is next door. Um, drinks are there as well. Um, let's eat there and try not to bring any food in. So we know we're cleaning one place when we finish. Thank you. Um, I'm sure. A lot of you have been um, following um, the event right here in Brent, uh, where, you know, behind me, they've been talking about the uh, bipolar disorder. Um, we're going on a 20 minutes break. I'm sure my phone as well needs to be recharged. 
you know, so as myself, I need to be recharged so that I could bring back uh, the remaining part of this program to you. Uh, this program is brought to you uh, live direct from uh, Brent in Wembley. Uh, Wembley is just around, uh, uh, I can see from my view here, I'm going to turn the camera a little bit. Uh, Niger diaspora, one hub connecting the Nigerians globally. Um, I've said it so many times, we all have opportunity to make this world a better place, but that can only be done you know, if you um, put in your own little bit of effort and do your own little bit, and then the world becomes a better place. Again, my name as usual, Olayomikoiki. If you have missed some of our events, you could check it on YouTube, Olayomikoiki, on my dad diaspora, and I'll be back again in the next 20 minutes to finish the completion of this um, let's talk about bipolar disorder with not only in London also in uh, Nigeria there's so many mental issues that needs to be looked into and we have a lot of people that are working on it I met someone on my way down here on the train she's actually working you know, in the Badon you know, in terms of giving back you know to the disability you know back in the Badon you know, she'll be coming uh, later on as well to speak to us and uh, other speakers as well. But for now, I need to charge the phone. I need to charge myself as well so that I could be back again and speak to you. This is again brought to you by Nigeria Diaspora. Thank you very much.